When you think about the word hope, what comes to mind? What comes to your mind when you hear the word hope? Substance of things hoped for, for, Hebrews 11 and verse 1. That's an excellent point. What else when you think about hope? Something to look forward to. to. That's another good, good, good definition. Can you think of anything else? Help. What's that? Help. Help. All good definitions. Do we need hope? Yes. Indeed we do. What would it be like to live a life of hopelessness? What would it be like to live without hope? Be a tragic life. Paul put it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19, a miserable life. But now let's look at Ephesians 2, verse 12, and let's look at the man's greatest need, one of his greatest needs. And really, these needs are linked together. If someone would, let us look at if let's, someone would read for us Ephesians from Ephesians chapter 2. Read verse number 12. Context is dealing, Paul is writing to the Ephesians, reminding them of their present condition by way of reminding them of who they were formerly, their, their past manner of life. And, and notice what is said in verse number 12 as we read this verse. That at the time you were Without Christ, there are several key phrases here. Without Christ, aliens, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, but above all, without God. Why were these Ephesians without hope? And the answer is given to us in this verse. Without God and without Christ. When you talk with people nowadays, when you talk with anyone, most of the time you're going to hear people talk about the hopes that they have, will you not? Just in general conversation. They'll they'll say, well, I hope to have this or I hope to, to do that. But do they ever mention the hope that is in Christ Jesus? No. A lot of people do not. As Christians... We need to spend a lot of time thinking about the hope that we enjoy, which we're going to talk about. Because millions upon millions of people living today are living without hope, are they not? As Christians, though, we live with and we live in hope. But what is the hope that we have? What is the hope that is found with God, with Christ, and in Christ Jesus? Eternal life, Titus chapter 1 in, in, in verse number 2. Eternal life. So when we obeyed the gospel, we gained the blessing of, of salvation from our past sins, having been washed from our past sins through the precious blood of the Lamb, having contacted it by faith and baptism. And as we walk in the light as He is in the light, what's occurring as children of God, as we walk thusly. The precious blood continues to cleanse us. I'm sorry. But yet, let's make another observation regarding Christians. I know several brothers and sisters in Christ who, who, who by their lives and words act as if they have no hope. They, they have the disposition that I cannot know if I'm saved. Now, does the Bible teach that? Can we know we are saved? Yes, we can. If we cannot know, then... We can't have hope. We can't have anything. We can't have faith if we cannot know. 
As a result, because Christians, some of our brothers and sisters give up, get, have this mindset, they simply give up their hope because they believe, I cannot know. But you go back to the world now. Some say, well, there's no hope for me. And the reason they say is, well, God cannot forgive me. And because I cannot be forgiven, and this is, we're going to build on this in the sermon this morning, because God cannot forgive me, I just have no hope. There's nothing for me in this life. There is a great need, is there not, to explore what the Bible, what the New Testament has to say about hope, is there not? Because when we study hope, as, faith, as faithful children of God, number one, our faith in God and in Christ is going to be strengthened. Number two, we're going to be a, better able to teach others. And we're going to be able to teach others that, yes, there is hope. You can have this hope. You do not have to live a life of hopelessness in this present world. You can enjoy the same hope that I enjoy. That's number two. Number three, where we want to impress upon every one of us the, the, re, the, the end result of this hope, the, 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 the results that come from living in hope, uh, of living a life of faithfulness unto God. Why do we live Christ-like in this present world? And that's what I want us to explore in class this morning. As we think about a life that is lived in and of hope. I want us to discuss, and that's what I, wanted, I want us to look at this morning. I want to get some good discussion going about, the, the, about four, four aspects of this hope. We're going to look at its reality. We're going to look at the blessings that it brings. We're going to look at its significance and ultimately the confidence we can have. Because that's what it ultimately comes down to, is knowing that we can have this hope, knowing what it brings... We can be confident, but not only can we be confident in this hope, we can be confident in teaching others that they can have this hope if they but recognize that they can have that hope and recognize that they can do what God would have them to do. It's possible. It's possible for all men everywhere to be saved, and it's possible for all men everywhere to have this hope. It's not mission impossible as some would view it. Rather, it's mission possible. As we get into the heart of our discussion this morning, first of all, let's discuss the fact that this hope is real. Let's look at the reality of this hope. And if someone would read for us from Titus chapter 1 in verse number 2, perhaps the most quoted verse regarding this hope in the entire New Testament. When we talk about hope, this is a verse that, I, that obviously every gospel preacher loves to use. And, I, and myself included, obviously. But let's look at some things from this verse that explain to us the reality of this hope. Titus chapter 1, verse number 2. Isn't this a comforting and encouraging and motivating scripture? In hope of eternal life. That's encouraging, but what's even more encouraging to me, and I've missed this in times past in my study of this verse, but what should be the most encouraging isn't the hope of eternal life. It's the fact that God promised and that he cannot lie. To me, that's the most encouraging thing. Is that, is that when God promises something, well, unlike we as human beings, when we fail to, to keep our promises at times, and how many of you in here have done that? I'm going to raise my hands twice because I've been doubly guilty of that from time to time. But again, I'm human. But yet God is our creator. He's far above us. When he promises something, we can take it to the bank. He is going to fulfill that promise. And hence the reality of this promise, of this hope, is established on the very fact that, that God is. That's, the great, that's one of the challenges we face in evangelism today, is it not? Is, is getting people to accept the reality of God. 
You think about the, our nation. It's becoming more and more godless, is it not? Atheism is on the move. And that means as Christians, you and I have a greater task ahead of us in our job to go and preach the gospel. It's convincing people that there is a God in heaven. But we, but we can be assured that, we can, that people can be convinced. Nebuchadnezzar, remember him in Dan, the book of Daniel? Heathen king. He ultimately came to recognize that there was a God in heaven, did he not? If a man so wicked as Nebuchadnezzar could, anyone and everyone living today can. We just have to have our faith in God and in His Word as we proclaim it. But understanding that God is real, that He exists, the reality of this hope is based upon, is established on His nature. What is God like? What kind of God is the God of heaven? God of love. That's an excellent point indeed. It is flowing out of that love is His... He's a just God. He's a loving and just God. And I like that point. Man's greatest problem is what? Three letter word. Sin. Sin. Man's greatest need? Salvation. But do we deserve salvation? Do we merit our salvation? Do, do we deserve to be saved from sin? No. no. God's justice demands punishment for sin. But yet there's where the love of God comes in, does it not? His love and grace. What does Titus chapter 2 verse 11 say? Let's build on this premise. Let's build on the fact of God's love for mankind and how it has manifested itself, how God's grace has revealed itself to man mankind. Someone, let's, let's read Titus chapter 2, verse number 11. Let's see, let's see what, what God has done for mankind. That is a marvelous statement, is it not? How has God's grace appeared to all men? Through Jesus the Christ. Why did Jesus come to this earth? We often sing this song. Why did my Savior come to earth? Because he should perish. Mm -hmm. He loved us. And he came to die for us. I like what he said in Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost wasn't just there in the first century. It's true today. He came to give his life a ransom. He came to die. That's how God's grace has revealed itself to all mankind. And hence, God's grace makes it possible for all mankind to be saved. And so, is it, is it not true that all can be saved? That's God's will, is it not? God's desire. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. God would have how many men to be saved? All. All men to be saved. But yet there's some in the religious world who, who claim that not all can be saved. Is there, is there not? There's some, some who would claim that not all can be saved, but, but intrinsically there are those who believe that they are so far gone that they can't be saved, as we're talking about this morning, that there's no hope. Now what's wrong with that view? If some say that I cannot be saved, what, what are they saying? Limiting the power of God. Limiting, mm -hmm, limiting God's power. And that's a dangerous thing to do. God's grace has appeared to all mankind. Christ died for all. God commended His love toward us. And that while we... No, no, no. Let, let's get that more personal. I like making it personal from time to time. And, and pardon me, I'm going to use my name in this case. 
God commendeth his love toward Robert Alexander and that while Robert Alexander was a sinner, Christ died for Robert Alexander. And you could put your name in, the blank, in that verse as well. And you could put your name in John 3.16 as well. For God so loved Robert Alexander that he gave his only begotten son. When we make things personal, we begin to see just how much God loves me, loves you and I. And that's the challenge we have, is getting people to see just how much God loves them and wants them to be saved and getting them to see that life doesn't have to be hopeless. That there is a hope they can enjoy. That they can change. Because it is by God's grace, through faith, that, that we are saved. That's a beautiful verse, Ephesians 2, verse 8, is it not? One of the most beautiful passages in all the Bible. Because we can be saved by God's grace through our obedience to Him, we have hope. And God is the God of all hope, is He not? Romans 15, 13. You want to, you, if you're taking notes, you might want to jot that verse down in your notes. The God of hope fills us with joy and peace in believing. Well, why does He do that? Well, that passage teaches us that we may abound in in hope. Hope makes a difference in our life, does it not? What does hope do for you? Exactly. It gives, gives life purpose and meaning. The hope of eternal life gives our life as Christians true meaning. Why, why are we living Christ? Why do we live Christ like? Because we have that hope. We have that promised hope. We have the hope that if we live faithfully, we can have a home in heaven with God, with Christ, and with all the with all the redeemed in the hereafter. Without that, life has no true meaning, separate and apart from God. Without God, without Christ, life is hopeless, is it not? God's gracious nature is manifested in the fact that, that this hope originates with Him. Because it originates with Him, He has provided the location for this hope in, Christ, in and through Christ Jesus. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16 teaches us that. Now our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us, I like the last part, and hath given us everlasting consolation in good hope through grace. I love that statement. Where does our hope come from? Where, what is, where does it come through? Jesus. Through Jesus, the object of God's grace. When we are saved by that grace, we enjoy this hope, and hence our hope comes through the grace of God. And how can we forget? How can we, also, how can we overlook that the reality of this hope, as we're discussing God, is established on the surety of His promises? We mentioned earlier that when God promises something, we can take it to the bank because God cannot lie. Unlike men, unlike men we can lie. But God will never lie, cannot lie. And hence, that's why our faith is in God. Hebrews 11 and verse 1 was brought up at the outset. We hope for heaven. Our faith in God, our life lived for God is a demonstration of that hope we have. It demonstrates that, that we are looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let me, use this, let me give you a funny illustration. One of the biggest problems I have in preaching, one of the things I'm working on constantly is eye contact. When I started preaching school, I had this big old pro I had a, this problem was worse. And so I'd get up in chapel and I'd just sort of look at the clock back there or I'd look at the ceiling. Finally, one of my instructors would put a, put a sign over the clock that said, look to the eyes and, and not to the sky. And my wife, Susan, has been working with me on this as well. 
But in a sense, I say all of this as Christians, we need to be looking to the sky, as it were, as we walk in this life, do we not? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, well, how do we look, look unto Him? By faith. That's how we do it. We walk by faith, not by sight. So as Christians, as I try to look you in the eye this morning, as I strive to do a better job of that, I also recognize that I need to be looking to the sky through the eye of faith at all times. Our hope is in God, in Christ, and in His promises. Now let's look at the blessing of this hope. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, and I think obviously we understand what we are dealing with here. So this point, we won't press this point too much. 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse number 3, if someone would read this passage for us. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, <coughs> who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Thank you. And again, notice, what, <coughs> notice again the results of our having obeyed the gospel. Obviously, we gain, we, 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 as a result of our putting Christ on in baptism, we access all those spiritual blessings. And we talk about those spiritual blessings, such as reconciliation to God and salvation. But notice, linked to, the, to those blessings is hope. Can we not say that the hope of eternal life for the Christian is a great spiritual blessing? Indeed, we can. You see, if we enjoy the blessing of salvation, we enjoy the blessing of hope. This, see, 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 when people say there's no hope for me, they're in other words saying, well, I cannot be saved. If not, why not? And that's why it's so important we teach the, these truths that there is hope. That hope is in Christ, through Christ. And in Him, through the, through the gospel of Christ. And of course, we understand that this hope as well is built upon the resurrection of Christ. And, and remember, if Christ was not raised, then we have no hope, do we not? But since He was raised, and we, we know He was raised, we can know the evidences are there. Since Christ was raised by the power of of God, we have this living hope. Again, Romans chapter 1, verse 4, for your notes. But you also think about what Christ said there in John 11, verse 25. We're, we're very familiar with the setting. Lazarus had, had passed away, and, and Christ came to the tomb, and we're very familiar with the statement that Jesus wept. But notice what he told Mary and Martha in John 11, verse 25 prior to raising Lazarus. And this gives us hope. This gave them hope. And certainly they affirmed that, that they said you know, that we'll see Lazarus again at the last day, resurrection of the last day. And certainly Christ built upon that when he said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And of course, he goes on to ask her, believe us how this? And of course, she said, yes. And we're very familiar with the, the results there, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Because of all of this, because Christ is the resurrection and the life, because he himself was raised, when he comes again, all who are in the graves are going to be raised. And if we have lived a life of faithfulness unto God, our hope is going to be fulfilled. We're going to receive eternal life. That's the blessing of this hope. That's the end result of this hope. Hence, let's look at the significance. Romans chapter 8, verse 24. Let's look at this verse. I think this, this ties right in. You notice how all this flows together. But I like what Romans chapter 8, verse 24 has to say regarding hope in this life. Why we need this hope. And if someone would, read this verse for us. For well, we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? Thank you. Hope and salvation. 
How is this possible? What does hope do? How are we saved? How does hope play this role in saving us? Have you ever thought about that? What role does hope play in our salvation? Indeed. Hope for the return of Christ. And that's how we live our life, is it not? We live it in the sphere of hope. We, 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 we lean upon the Word of God. We trust in the promises of God. But not only that, I suggest this morning as well that, that it strengthens us. It gives, it gives us assurance, does it not? Knowing what, again, you, you read John 14, verses 1 through 3. The most beautiful words spoken by Christ. If I come again, I, when I come again, I will come again and I will receive you unto my own, that where I am, there you may be also, paraphrasing. Christ said, I will come again. As Christians living this life, what motivates us? Knowing that Christ will come again. That we can be received into his own and that where he is, we can be there also. But you know what else? That verse, those three verses motivate us even more for evangelism, does it, do they not? When people, I think one of the things we, I need to do, we need to do a better job of, and I know this, is when people say that it's hopeless, when people b- believe that salvation, that they cannot be saved, cannot be forgiven, that life is hopeless, take them to John 14. Teach them that you can be where Christ is. It's possible. It's not an impossible endeavor. It, it's possible for all to go there. Because that's God's desire. As we mentioned, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. And that's why God is long-suffering to us. Word. Does God want anyone to die in a lost condition? No. He's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. When people read these two verses, they need to realize that they can have hope. We're going to have to hurry now, but they can have hope. God wants them to have hope. And that hope can sustain them in this life. You ever have a lot of, you ever have just some really tough days in this life where you just where nothing ever goes right? Y'all ever had one of those just days where you just, you know, oh just might get you through those days. Faith and hope. It gets me through them. It encourages us because we know there is something far better than this life. Again, borrowing from the words of the song we often sing, this world is not our home, we're just a passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And you know what? I can't feel at home in this world anymore. And as Christians, we should never feel at home in this world anymore. The Apostle Paul didn't feel at home, did he? Because he said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is what? Gain. Gain. As Christians, death is gain. Remember what the psalmist said, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. You think about how God views the death of a faithful child of God. Precious. Last November, no, it was last November, correct? Last November, not this past November, it was the November before last, November 2013. We were in Saudi, living in Saudi Daisy at the time before moving to Florida. I got word, and I want to I, I share this with you because this still has an impact on my life to this very day. My Uncle Ray called me. No, it's my, my mom. My Uncle Ray called me from, from Manchester and told me that my Uncle Dwight wanted to be baptized into Christ. 
And that just, we were getting ready for Robbie's birthday party. It, it, it was November 2013. Now I have the full date now. We were getting ready for Robbie's birthday party. And I heard those words. And I just stopped in my tracks. You see, my Uncle Dwight, he was on in his 70s, but he had lived a, a hard life. He had lived a life of sin, debauchery. And at the time, he was dealing with cancer. It was terminal. And for the longest time, I, I, we'd always thought, you know, with how he was conducting himself... He'll never obey the gospel. He did. I dropped everything, drove, drove an hour and 20 minutes to Manchester with the help of three people because he, was, he could hardly walk. His back was in, was, in, was in awful shape. With the help of three people, we baptized my Uncle Dwight into Christ Saturday evening. If you want to know what his hope was, he told my Uncle Ray and my mom after he was baptized, you know, I, I can see my mama and daddy again, can't I? My, my grandpa, Eston Sism, was an elder in the Lord's Church at Pocahontas and Morrison for, for a long time. It made a great influence on my life. And I can go to heaven now, can't I? Was what he was saying. Several, for several months after that, even though he was seriously ill and could hardly get around, he would attend as many services of the Lord, worship God as he possibly could. He would be there knowing he was in terrible shape, but he wanted to go. He, he said that he wanted to be there just so he could experience a little bit of heaven before he died. What it would be like. He died this past November. I got the word that he had passed finally after a long battle with cancer. And we're going to have to close now. But I want to drive home this point. I was able to preach in that sermon because he had obeyed the gospel and he'd lived godly the time he remained. That he went from living a hopeless life to living a life of hope in Christ. And I said in my lesson that you know I made a mistake thinking that he would never obey the gospel. Who am I to say that no one will ever obey the gospel? And who am I to say? Who are we to say that someone will never obey? I say this. And we're going to build on this in the sermon here in a few minutes. Hope is possible for all. Change is possible for all. It's not something that is impossible. My uncle finally realized what he needed to do and he did it. Now he's going to reap the eternal rewards for his decision. May we as Christians do a better job, and may I as a gospel preacher do a better job of teaching people that there is hope, that they can, that you, that they can be forgiven, no, no matter how vile the sin they may have committed. The blood of Christ is powerful enough to cleanse it. They just have to decide they want to change and that they want to enjoy this living hope. Thank you so much for your participation this morning, for your comments in this class, and I hope that what we have said and discussed this morning has benefited you all. Thank you so much.